RuneScape is a game where there are many sources of items, from bossing to skilling to mini games, but nothing is more exciting than opening a treasure chest. From endgame chests everybody dreams of to forgotten chests that nobody knows, chests exist all throughout RuneScape. In this series, I aim to answer one simple question. Can you complete every raid in RuneScape with your only source of items being from chests? The typical account progression for an Iron Man would be a Trident of the Seas, an Abyssal Whip, maybe even a Blowpipe, but being locked exclusively to chests, we cannot get any of these items. The best mid-game gear upgrade we can get is actually Barrows, so to prepare for raids, let's loot the most important chest in the game. So while we think about a plan, let's get back to Camdozel. We've been camped out here since the end of last episode and we're currently sitting on about 11,000 shards, which is pretty crazy. As I said last episode, we're here essentially just for early game skilling supplies and any kind of armor upgrade we can grab. Ooh, a maze random. Remember, we can't complete these directly, but we can fully take advantage of the chests inside, so we're definitely doing this. And 80 minutes later, we've got some really cool stuff. These runes and arrows are just adding up now and they're so, so helpful. I hate dismissing these. While I was sitting around looting chests in the maze, I had a lot of time to think about how to actually complete barrows properly. With no protection prize and low combat stats, we need to heavily rely on runes to actually be able to kill the melee brothers. Our best option for runes is the Dorgish Khan chests. One of these is a magic based chest that gives us almost every type of rune. But to unlock this city, we do need one problematic requirement. 23 agility. We can't do agility courses, so the only low level agility training we can do is underwater agility on Fossil Island as it involves looting chests. But to get there, we need 10 agility itself. The only other way we can obtain agility experience is by completing chest related quests, and believe it or not this only leaves three possible options. Recruitment Drive, Underground Pass, and Ichthorin's Little Helper. Recruitment Drive doesn't get us enough experience for level 10, and Underground Pass absolutely sucks at one agility, so let's give Ichthorin's Little Helper a try. We also need to complete the Shades of Morton for a minigame teleport close to Barrows, so here's our checklist for our first Barrows kill count. So I decided to make a head start with Herblor and start Druidic Ritual. We grabbed Ami, dipped him in the cauldron, and then finally unlocked Herblor. I also decided to complete the Goblin Recipe for Disaster subquest here to not only unlock an additional quantity to the Lumbridge Chest's shop, making obtaining food twice as fast, but also because it gives us a thousand crafting experience, which is really helpful for unlocking the 20 crafting for the Shades of Morton quest. Ooh, I completely forgot the second quest unlocks bronze gloves. These are a huge upgrade for us right now. We didn't even buy any gloves before. Yoink. With Herblor unlocked, let's work on obtaining level 15 for the Shades of Morton. Herblor on this account is in a wild place. Late game, we've got raids, the sinister chest and the grubby chest to obtain some higher level herbs. But for lower level training, we only really have the Isle of Soul chest's guams. Luckily though, we do have access to one obscure method, Brudu Victims. There are three types of Brudu Victims in the Taibo one Eye Cleanup minigame, which can all be damaged in obscure ways. White Brudu Victims can be damaged using food, gaining cooking experience gained based on the damage dealt. Yellow Brudu Victims can be damaged using Relicens Bombs or Sanfu Serums, granting Herblore experience and green brudu victims which can be damaged using anti-poisons which also grants herblore experience. While the white ones are irrelevant due to them granting cooking experience and the yellow ones have pretty impossible potion requirements, the green brudu victims are our saviours. If you remember last episode we found the observatory dungeon chests which contain anti-poisons so we have a valid resource from a chest and we can use it in any way we want, in this case damaging the brudu victims for herblore experience. Let's take 14 anti-poisons and 14 pieces of food because I'm not sure how hard we're actually going to get a hit doing this. Oh my god, we found one already! So all we have to do is use a dose of anti-poison on the Brudu victim and it'll take some damage. We gain Herblore experience equal to double the damage dealt. And the max hit with a regular anti-poison is 20. And there's 5 Herblore. I think we got 216 experience for this one Brudu victim. This might not actually take that long. Boo! Three white ones on one world, but at least people are currently spawning them. Speaking of spawning them, this whole world hopping experience is very tedious. Normally, we could simply do the minigame ourselves to spawn them, but as there's nothing chest related about it, we aren't allowed to do that. 
We can only use the existing Brudu victims that are a part of the world as a way to use our resources, the anti-poison pots. Which means we're heavily relying on other people and a little bit of luck here. Oh crap, we've just hopped straight into a tribesman. And it's poisoned us. It's poison super deadly hitting 11s, so I'm so happy that we've got anti-poisons on us right now. Oh my god, finally another one. That 7 herb law, we are slowly, slowly getting there. And a long, long time later, this one marks 10 herb law, which means we now have the herb law requirement to get to Fossil Island. But we still need five more. One, two, got a bank, three, four, and five, uh, never mind. Five! We had some Guams in the bank for the last tiny bit of experience, but there's 15 herb law, which is the final level we need to complete our pre Barrows quests. During our time at Brudu Victims, I did find something interesting though. As I was hopping through the world, there seems to be multiple level 17 bots with very similar sounding names. I have no idea what they're doing as they're normally just standing around, but I guess with the Gauchuba being worth 1.5 million GP currently, it could be a Gauchuba bot farm, who knows. Now we have one of our skilling requirements out of the way, let's work on another. 20 crafting. Currently, access to wool is impossible and gems are scarce, so the only real method of crafting we have is soft clay. Camdozel's simple lockboxes drop clay at a rate of around 2.5 soft clay for every 5.5 lockboxes opened. As we know from last episode, we sped up our Baronite Shard gain significantly by unlocking mining, but to hit 20 crafting, we'll need over 50 soft clay, which means an average of 100 simple lockboxes. This is gonna take a while. Lucky for us, we did some mining between episodes. Being sat on 18,000 shards already should help out a lot. In fact, let's go use these now and see where we're at. Of course, on our last run, absolutely zero of the simple lockboxes spawn. What rotten luck. Well, we've got a lot of chests to open. Let's do the simples first. Ooh, and not bad at all. 35 soft clay. Not as many as we need, but it takes a nice chunk out of the crafting grind. Oh, and look at the sexy little armor upgrades. Not bad at all. I opened up all the other lockboxes and didn't really get anything too interesting apart from some steel plate legs. But with only 35 soft clay, we have to go back to mining. Never lucky. And there's 55 mining. We're really getting up there now. 7,500 shards, another 10 volt runs. Let's go. Okay, 10 runs done, 23 simple. Probably not gonna be enough clay, but let's find out. At least we got some. Okay, we got five clay so far. That's really not enough, is it? Oh dear. Oh! But we did get the myth legs upgrade. That is amazing. Let's see if we get any more armor in these. Steel arrows are actually really good. And silver bars. And some magic gear. This is actually not bad at all. As you can see as well, a tin and copper are stacking up, which is going to be really useful to start smithing. I am a dwarf and I'm digging a hole. Diggy diggy hole. Diggy diggy hole. More chests. Clay, clay, clay. Oh, that's a lot of clay. Okay, that's really good. Clay. Oh, that is so much. God, we just need some more in this last batch. We've got 57. 57 clay might be enough to get us 20 crafting. So let's go and do one thing first. We're going to complete Murder Mystery because it's a part of Recipe for Disaster. Funnily enough, we can complete this quest only using an item from a chest. So... Very weird feeling, but it's one of the only quests that we can do purely from chests, and it's chest related. Absolutely perfect. And there's Murder Mystery completed. 1,406 crafting XP, we've got to drop the coins, and that is 15 crafting. Five levels to go. Because we got this soft clay from a chest, we can use it in any way we want, and for now, that means making some unfired pottery. We do need to do the highest level we can, which currently is Bull, and the reason that we did Murder Mystery first is because you've got a chance at breaking them. And doing it this way, having a higher crafting level, gives us less chance of that. There's 16 crafting. Now, we've only got two inventories of these, so I'm not sure if we're going to have enough, but we do get XP for firing them after. So let's see where we end up. Who the hell is this chick? Why have I never seen Tassie Slipcast before? I've trained here so much in the past. Who the hell is this? 
Well, now we use these unfired balls on the pottery oven, and as you can see, we get actual balls. These do give less experience, but there's 17 crafting, and we just got 18 in the first inventory. We just hit 19 crafting, so now we're actually gonna use all of our soft clay on plant pots. I believe this is actually our only method of obtaining plant pots to eventually be able to farm trees. So this is genuinely very important for this account. And here it is, 20 crafting. We did have enough. That's our second skilling requirement. We just need five fire making now, so let's go get that real quick. Luckily, we got a tinderbox and a bunch of logs from Camdozel, so we can do this. And there's five fire making. We can now burn pyre logs, and with that, there's just one requirement left. Priest in Peril is a quest that unlocks a chest, meaning shades of Morton and Barrows, so we can obtain the items in any way we want. The thing is, Rune Essence and Pure Essence is still quite an issue for us, because there's no easy way to get them. Luckily though, Rune Mysteries is available because it unlocks Dogish Khan, so let's go and get that done. And there's Rune Mysteries completed, required to access Dogish Khan. We just have to mine some Pure Essence quickly for Priest in Peril. Remember, we cannot mine Essence and use it normally, but because it is required for a chest-related quest, we are allowed to mine just enough to complete the quest. So we mined our essence, killed a cute little puppy, slaughtered a monk, and gave a bald guy 50 essence as smooth as his head, and we completed Priest in Peril, actually giving us access to Barrows. There's also 15 prayer. We're still miles away from protection prayers, but we're only a few steps away from Mauritania. It's like a whole new world, with Barrows and the Theatre of Blood a very important world at that. With Mauritania unlocked, we're officially able to do Barrows, but can we complete it? Not really. We still need runes, which require the Dogish Khan chests, and as we remember from earlier, that means we need agility. Both of our agility options absolutely suck. Underground Pass and Dicklerin's Little Helper require a lot of annoying running with agility obstacles whose success is reliant on the player's agility level. At one agility, both are very, very annoying. I'm going to give Iclorin's Little Helper a shot, and we can get every item we need for it apart from Willow Logs. Whilst we can get quest items from anywhere in the game for chest related quests, without 30 woodcutting, Willow Logs are very annoying to obtain. The best method we have is actually the Shades of Morton minigame, and as this minigame is purely chest related, I think it's the right choice to obtain Willow Logs from there. And there's the Shades of Morton completed, not only giving us access to all of the chests inside, but also giving us a minigame teleport to take us right back here. We are going to be doing a lot of combat now, so we need to grab some food. Having two of everything here feels so much better. It's literally twice as fast and twice as little world hopping. We made a bunch of food and now we're back in the Shades of Morton. I know we said we can't buy things from normal shops because they're not chests. However, this olive oil is an exception. To open the Shades of Morton chests, this item is literally required because we need to use it to turn normal logs into pyre logs, so we can burn the shared remains for keys. So, because a chest is locked without this item, we are allowed to buy as many as we need. But it's not cheap. Well, we've ran into an annoying little bottleneck. To turn our olive oil into sacred oil for pyre logs, we need to obtain 10 sanctity in the Shades of Morton minigame. To do this, we have two options. Kill the Shades attack in the temple, or repair the temple walls. With nowhere to obtain a hammer until we unlock the Dorgish Kong chests, our only choice is to kill Law Shades for 2% Sanctity each, which is much more irritating. Not only do we barely have the combat stats or food to keep up with this, but our Sanctity also falls over time, so if kills take us too long, we actually can't progress. 5 food left and 16% Sanctity, I think we're just about going to make it. That's 24%, let's go make some sacred oil. The reason we overshot past the 10 mark is because each sacred oil we make actually lowers our sanctity a little bit. Well, we've managed to make six. That should be enough for now, as I believe each log uses two doses. So we have 12 attempts at the willow logs we need. <laughs> oh man, I am an idiot. I just made oak pyre logs and I've not got the fire making level to use them. <laughs> There's 20 fire making. I am an idiot, man. The typical gameplay loop of Shades of Morton is kill Shades, pick up their remains, burn them with a pile log, and then obtain keys from their corpses. We then use those keys on the chests within this dungeon and obtain loot. There are six types of Shades of varying combat levels, and as we get to higher tier Shades, 
we require higher tier logs and higher fire making levels. Which means for now we are limited to oak pyre logs, which means we can only burn lore and fringe shades, the other four are off limits. The main reason we're here is for willow logs to complete the Ichthorin's little helper quest. The only chests to provide willow logs are the steel ones. Luckily for us, fringe shades are our best source of steel keys, so we need to kill level 60 fringe shades and burn their remains using oak pyre logs. There is one more item here I'd absolutely love to get though. Because my goal is full six brother barrows runs, I need to be able to kill both Kurils and Arims. And with no prayer levels, this is going to be a challenge. I believe flinching is possible, but they despawn after 10 minutes, so we need to kill them fast. And thankfully, there are two items from steel chests that can help us out. The Mithril Spear Poisonous and the Adamant Dagger Poisonous. Both of these are pretty rare, but if we can hit one of these, it makes our chance of completing Barrows go up significantly. Anyways, Willow Logs have a 1 in 13 drop rate. We have 12 chances, wish us luck. I tried flinching these for the longest time and they just keep resetting, so we have to face these head on. They hit hard, so we're only managing around 2 kills in inventory right now, but at least we're making progress. Let's use our first ones. No, that's the wrong key. No way, both of them were bronze keys? These are the rarest keys on the drop table. Oh well, let's go use them. No way. A steel spear poisonous? This might actually work. If we don't hit a better poison weapon, this will be our fallback. This is so good to hit. Sorry for doubting your bronze keys. Five food for one remains. This is really slow right now. Okay, we managed to get eight that time. Not bad at all. Okay, we've got some remains banked. We have 10 logs, but the problem with only having one way there is we need to wait for this damn mini game timer to cool down. Oh, I forgot we got prayer experience from this. There's our first actual prayer level from training. 16 prayer. That was so much better. Seven steel keys in eight remains. This should be good. Key number one, a normal mithril spear. That's a shame. A steel kite. Oh, and an undead zealot spawned. This is interesting. Undead zealots are spawned from the chest, meaning they are chest related and we can kill them and loot whatever they drop. Problem is, they only drop bleached bones. But these bones can be used on the altar in this dungeon to fully recharge our prayer points, which will be very useful in the future when we unlock protection prayers. The hell? A collection log? Oh, a flam tier bag. This can be used to store items for repairing the Shades of Morton Temple. But as we can't actually buy any of the items from the shop, this is kind of useless. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We got the Adamant Dagger P. This is huge. Oh my god, and an amulet of strength back to back? This is such a good opening. This is like a best in slot amulet for such a long time. And willow logs. What the hell? We're finished here. Holy shit. This has gone above and beyond. Best in slot amulet, best in slot poison weapon, and the willow logs. I am freaking ecstatic. Well, I guess we'd best go and start this quest and work towards unlocking agility. Last episode, a few people were upset I abandoned our cute little kitty. So here you go. Have a new one. Our first step into Sophenum, where hell awaits. This is the Pyramid of Nightmares. I said earlier that our options were Underground Pass or this, and I do not regret my decision. But much like the Underground Pass, there are obstacles here that we need to pass that agility level helps with. The rest of the obstacles here are fairly easy. We can click the map to avoid almost all the traps and simply run for a tick to avoid the monsters hitting us. But this gap, this freaking gap is a nightmare. Every time we fail this gap, we get sent back to earlier in the pyramid and get damaged a little bit. The worst part is, every time we fail, it drains our run energy. And to actually attempt to jump the gap, we need 20% minimum or it is a guaranteed failure. We find ourselves standing around to regenerate run energy far too often on this account. I can't wait to get some agility levels. Oh my god, we did it. We did one. No way. I mean, we've got to do it a lot more, but holy crap. Okay, step one completed. I think we've got really lucky. I believe this one's Het, which only uses melee, which means we should be able to flinch it on the table. I know the ones that use magic can hit across it, so I'm really, really, really hoping we can flinch this. If we can, we have a shot. Come on, give me a first timer. Give me a first timer right now, please. Oh. Oh, we don't need to make it again. Oh, I am so happy. Come on, we've just got to be able to flinch this. 
Yes. Oh, we've got a flinching spot. Oh, we're going to be able to do this. I don't know about the other fight, but this one is going to be easy. I was not sure. I am so happy I got hit. If I got any of the magic ones here, I would have been screwed. And there we go. We've killed the first NPC. What the hell is going on with my camera here? What? I've never seen that before. The camera's like not positioned sent. Whoa, that's very, very, very weird. What the hell? I've never seen that before. That was so weird. Okay, this is going to be the hardest boss fight we've done yet. It uses magic, it can hit up to six, and we can't flinch it. I've got a lot of food though. Let's hope we can do this. Wish me luck. Oh, this is easy. What was I worried about? Did I even need to bank? I had like six food left. I got a full inventory thinking this would be super difficult. And that's it. There we go. We can't pick up the defense pot, but that is pretty much quest completed. And here we go. Ichthorin's little helper completed at one agility. Not many people can say that. Straight up to 19 and we get 19 wood cutting, which is going to be really good later on in the account. Remember, we could complete this quest because it's a requirement for Beneath Cursed Sands to unlock the Tombs of Amaska. So, we're one step closer to raids. The whole point of getting agility was to complete Death to the Dorgashun and unlock the chest that gives us runes so that we can complete Barrows. This requires 23 agility, meaning we're currently 4 levels short. To obtain the rest of the levels, let's go and unlock our primary agility training method on this account. Underwater agility. This training method takes place on Fossil Island. Well, under it. Now we have 10 agility and got the Herblow level earlier, we can actually complete the dig site. But first, let's take a little detour. Thanks to many people in the comments last episode, it was brought to my attention that I can actually loot the Stronghold of Security for some starter GP. So I went and grabbed the first floor's chest, but it turns out the second floor is a sack? That's not a chest. I kept going lower and luckily the third floor is also a chest, meaning I grab my sweet, sweet 5,000 gold pieces. But it turns out the final floor is a rocking chair? I guess the baby can keep their boots. Especially these ones. Being 6,000 GP richer, we went on to complete the dig site, which is obviously a requirement for underwater agility chests. And gained a huge 15,300 mining experience but more importantly, 2,000 Herblor experience. We've seen how annoying that can be to train. To actually access Fossil Island, we need one more quest, Burn Voyage. But here's where we run into a little trouble. To complete this quest, we require 100 Kudos, a point system given to us in the Varok Museum. There are multiple ways to obtain Kudos, but none of them are really chest related. So we need to make a few exceptions here, or else all chests on Fossil Island will be inaccessible. The maximum kudos available is 230, but the only ones we can argue are chest related are the quests we complete to unlock chests, and even then it's far less than 100. I ran some calculations, and as we can't access fossils without being on Fossil Island, and we can't complete every quest that gives kudos, I'm going to allow myself to complete both the cleaning find section and the museum quiz, and that only just barely scrapes us by. We've found all five important pieces here, let's go hand them in. There's 50 kudos, halfway there. What's kind of annoying about cleaning finds is it's actually possible to obtain a clean necklace, which lets you enchant ruby necklaces into dig site pendants. But as the activity is not chest related, we can't actually use this, so we're forever unable to enchant them. All those nature documentaries really paid off. Here's another 28 kudos, as well as 1000 experience in Slayer and Hunter, giving us a little bit of a boost. The only other option for Kudos we have is to talk to Historian Minus in the museum and tell him stories about various quests. Uh, that's not good. We only had two stories to tell. We still need 12 Kudos. So we did a bit of research and we ended up completing Demon Slayer, required for a recipe for disaster subquests. Merlin's Crystal, also required for the recipe for disaster. And Hazel Cult, which is required for Secrets of the North, to unlock us the frozen cash from the Phantom Musper. This gave me 103 kudos and we could finally complete Burn Voyage to access Fossil Island. 
We're currently on Glassblowing Island, just to the north of Fossil Island, and this is where we dive to access underwater agility. I'll see you on the other side. As you can see, we're now underwater, and our character is swimming. If we were too heavy, our character would actually be walking, and we wouldn't be able to access some of the areas down here. We also have an oxygen bar at the top left, akin to a lot of retro games. If this bar hits zero, we drown. However, this is a safe death. Scattered throughout the underwater agility arena are bubbles which, when stood in, replenish your oxygen bar back up a little bit. There are two items that can give infinite oxygen, the fishbowl helmet and the diving apparatus, but as we cannot access them on this account, we'll have to rely on the oxygen bubbles to train agility. Underwater agility can give us multiple currencies. The ones we want to focus on are the mermaid's tears and the glistening tears. These allow us to access Marin's market and offers us multiple rewards. The mermaid's tears are used in this shop, selling fossils, a trident weapon, seaweed spores and bowls of fish, and the glistening tears are used in this shop and can be traded for experience. We can opt for only agility experience or only thieving experience, or a mix of both. The most efficient option here is both, but because we've got many thieving methods, later in the account we might opt purely for the agility experience here. So how does this agility course work? Well, it's simple. Scattered underwater are chests and clams that we can loot for a small amount of experience and some of the currency we just explained. But we can't loot every chest. We can only loot the one that is currently active, which we can see by looking at the arrow on the minimap. The chests change frequently, but if you get to a chest early, you can loot it multiple times. We're going to be using this bubble I'm in right now as a base camp, and let's grab some chests. And there's the first chest. The first chest doesn't actually give us any loot, but it enables us to obtain loot from this point on. Oh, and here we go, our first actual chest. We got six tiers from our first chest. That is absolutely amazing. As you can see, we also get Numalite, but our uses for that are few and far between. We'll keep it regardless though. Oh, it's taunting me. The active one spawned right next to me, but it's a bloody clam. The chest is right next to it. As you can see, we do have a few problems here. We can't actually reach every chest because we can't swim fast enough for it to be worth it. So we're only taking on maybe half the chests available. On top of this, half of the time, they're clams, not chests. And well, clams aren't chests, so that loses another 50%. So we're effectively doing underwater agility at 25% efficiency. In fact, it's even worse than that. On a regular account, we could obtain an item called flippers. And while worn, these allow the player to run underwater, making us move about twice as fast. With all of these together, this minigame takes us about 8 times longer than normal. And considering this is our primary training method, we're in for a long, albeit fun ride. To help us out, we do have a few shortcuts as you can see on this map. But even with these, the majority of the chests on the right hand side are just not viable. So we're going to be sticking to the left side. The XP per hour here is really, really low as you can see on the runelight tracker. But the majority of the experience does come from turning in the glistening tears. I'm not sure how many we'll collect, but I imagine we don't need that many for level 23. Let's go and see how much XP 13 gets us. Like I said earlier, I think both is more efficient, and because we need some more thieving levels for the Dorgashan chests, let's kill two fish with one stone. 78 experience for 13? Honestly, that's really low for how long it took, but it's all we can do. So, so, so many of these are clams. We're back at Marion's Market, we've got over 100 tiers, and ooh, as you can see, because we've gained an agility level since last time, each tier is now worth 7 agility experience on shared. It's nice to see it scale with level. 49 thieving and 22 agility, we're so close. One more level until we unlock the last hurdle before Barrows. Huh, this is the first time I've had this room. Three chests with access to an air bubble, this is literally the god room for me. I hope we get these more often. What? Wait, <laughs> wait, it reset to the same chest? I didn't even know this was possible. Yoink. 56 tiers, let's hope it's enough. Ooh, experience is 8 per tier now, this should surely do it. And there's 23 agility, I am so excited. Before we leave, I want to go through why mermaid tiers may be useful to us too. If we take a look in this shop, we can buy a multitude of fossils, a merfolk trident, a seaweed spore, or a bowl of fish. The thing we're actually most interested in here is the bowl of fish, as according to the wiki, it gives us many rolls at various types of fish, so we might get some decent food. 52 shrimp? What? Well, this is kind of what I expected with 4 fishing, as it does scale with fishing level. 
but honestly it's also unexpected because I only expected six. On the wiki it says each tier of fish drops in zero to two quantity all of the time, but we clearly got more than two shrimp per bowl here, so I think the wiki's wrong. And what actually happens is it drops zero to 20 fish and splits it between the fish you're eligible for. Once again, a huge win for Discovery in the chest locked series. Anyways, I really want to do barrows now. I've spent hours upon hours preparing this episode, doing inefficient training methods, and finally we're at a final hurdle, runes. As stated earlier, the best way for us to obtain runes is the Dorgish Khan chest, which requires 52 thieving. We finally have the agility level to complete these quests, so we completed the Lost Tribe, dropping the quest rewards, and then moved on to complete Death to the Dorgishan. So we're doing the quest and we've had to come down to the Ham storeroom. I don't need to do any of this yet, but this place is where we'll be obtaining most, if not all, of our teleport jewellery when we need it, as these chests in the room drop a lot of it. There's the final quest of the episode completed, unlocking us the beautiful city of Dorgish Khan. We also flew from 1 to 13 range, which I completely forgot about, but we have one last thing to do before obtaining runes, and I mean it this time. Underwater agility got us level 50 thieving, but to thieve the average chests here, we need level 52. So let's go loot some brand new chests we've not tried out yet. This building contains two chests, and they actually have completely different drop tables. This is a nature room chest, and this is a 50 coin chest. As you can guess, the nature room chest has a nature rune in it, alongside the three gold pieces. And the 50 GP chest gives, do I really have to say it? Like with most chests, this is a game of world hopping again, but with two chests per world and a combined 150 experience, this should not take too long. As an added perk, we get to see everyone doing agility and some cool pets look. I'd hate living in this house though. And there's 51 thieving, and I never thought I'd see someone else here, but there was someone here, that's weird. Who else uses these chests? And this chest marks 52 thieving. Took a while, but here we are. We can now thieve from average chests. Not a bad haul, we got 4k and 144 nature runes, which honestly could come in handy in the future. Alks are going to be really good for it, like if we got duplicate adamant scimitars. And with 52 thieving achieved, there's just one chest standing between us and Barrows. There are three types of average Dorgish Khan chests. They all require 52 thieving, but all contain wildly different loot. The majority of chests down here are the standard average chests. They don't drop too much, but they can give us quite a few coins. Next, we have the chests in Xanik's house. And while not much use this episode, this chest is incredible, offering us an infinite supply of burn bolts, as well as a burn crossbow, a burn dagger for defense reduction, and easy clues. One could argue this is actually just as important for us as runes are. And finally, the bread and butter of our entire account's magic, Oldak's chest. This offers us every type of rune except from Astral, Blood, Soul, Wrath, and Combination runes. It also gives us a very cool item that a lot of people probably don't know exists. The Dorgish Khan Sphere. This sphere is a one-click teleport that teleports us to a random location in Dorgish Khan. While not useful for most people, this might be our only one-click teleport and being able to teleport straight back here will save us a lot of time in the future. Now, if you've been paying attention, you might be thinking, hey Teller, sure you've got runes, but how do you actually get a spade to dig into the Barrow's crypts? And well, remember I said that Xanik's chest was important? It also contains a spade, so let's go grab one of those first. Oh yeah, we can also get big bones here, giving us at least some form of prayer training on the account. Ooh, a mining helmet. This might not seem like much, but it is our only current helmet, and it can act as a light source when equipped, that's great. It actually looks so ugly though. And there's our first burn bolts drop. These can drop 1 to 89, so we did get a low roll, but I am happy with that. We need as many of these as possible in the future. And there's the spade. This chest also drops a hammer, which is going to be a huge help for Shades of Morton. So let's stay for one of those two. That didn't take too long. With that hammer, we'll soon be able to open all of these Baronite deposits for more Camdozel runs. And while we can't do it yet, we have got all of this that we can make now and get some smithing up. The account is looking awesome now, I am so excited. And here is arguably the most important chest on our account. Unfortunately, Oldak's a bit of a tight ass and only has one chest, so it will be much slower here, but it will be worth it. Ooh, and our first bit of runage. Oh, I'm so happy. 
Interesting. This also gives unpowered orbs, and I am going to keep those because I believe we can do the spells. Because all you need is runes and the orbs. So, uh, yeah, let's just bank as many of these as we can. Well, assuming we get a load of battle staffs from raids, gauntlet, shades. There's quite a lot of places that give us battle staffs. So, yeah, I am definitely going to bank as many of them as possible. God, that adds up fast. We've got a thieving level already. These give 200 XP per pick lock. Oh, and there's our first law runes. They're going to be huge when I get some teleports. We've currently been walking all around the game from Edgeville to Arden and everywhere, and it's really slow. I can't wait to get magic up. And these cosmics are great too. The other chest that we unlock here gives us jewelry, and this is what we're going to be using to enchant them. Even more teleports. I think we got some from Cam Dozel already, but that is all four elemental talismans. Oh, the first mind rune drop was the max. Now, I'm not sure how long I'm going to be here, but I want at least 1,000 to 2,000 mine runes to start Barrows. And then hopefully it sustains itself. But we also need a lot of fire runes from here, so we will be here for a long, long time. And this is our first full inventory. Like I said, I will be banking all of the unpowered orbs, but I'll also bank all the elemental talismans, because we can turn them into tiaras for future runecrafting experience. And there is the nature runes. Now all we need to do is watch all of these stacks just fly up. Well, fly up for you guys. For me, it's going to be a long, long time. And level 57 thieving marks a very important chest, the grubby chest in Forthos. We're not going to be doing any of that this episode, but that can give us the best food we can get in the game. And this is what around four hours down here looks like. We're averaging around 100 mine runes an hour, which isn't great. But we mainly care about the elemental runes because Barrows should self-supply as the combat runes. At least I hope so. We are very deep into this right now and for some reason the mind runes are the hardest to get. No idea why. But the chaos are looking really good. And this chest marks 64 thieving which unlocks us the lizard man temple chests which are going to come in handy. I'm not going to get to a thousand mine runes. I'm going to go right now because I really, really, really want to do some barrows. I've been here for 10 hours. Not the most efficient, but I have been here for 10 hours, which is pretty crazy. We ended up with 66 Dogish Khan spheres, and that is really good because they're a one-click teleport we can use basically anywhere. Finally, here we are. The last 100 hours of playtime were all for this. Look at our setup and tell me I don't look like a chad. You might be wondering why we're here at 1 Magic and 16 Prayer, and well, we can actually complete Barrows like this. And not only complete Barrows, but get full 6 Brother runs. I'm sure Barrows needs no introduction, but I'll give a brief one anyways. The Barrows Brothers are 6 bosses a player can kill, and then loot the chest underground to obtain various loot. Each brother killed gives an additional loot roll, and also adds that brother's armour to the drop table. When all 4 pieces of a brother's armour set are worn, they provide additional buffs. These are going to be key for us to start raids, so our goal is to get as many unique items from here as possible. And to do that, we need to kill all six brothers for the maximum amount of loot rolls. The Barrows brothers are considered some of the easiest bosses in the game, but without protection prayers and very low combat levels, let's see how difficult they truly are. So as you can see here, he is trapped. If we turn run off and manually cast Wind Strike, this part is very important. If we auto cast wind strike here, it's going to be a tick later than it would be manual casting. So we do not want to do this. Instead, we have to manually cast while walking, which will bring us to here. And then we have to press control to turn run on. So if I'm walking right now, you can see it's a walk. But if I press control while my run is off, I actually get to run. And this means that we can actually do what we need to do. So if we walk and cast this, and then run to this tile, we get a shot off, and then he's going to be safe spotted again, if I actually decide to, uh, you know, click the right tile. And again, we can do the same thing, we walk to attack, and then click over here with run by using control. With Darok, you can only do it on two sides of the crypt, so we have to literally sit here and do this, and then walk back around to here for him to be safe spotted. But with two of the other brothers, you can do it on all four sides of the coffin, so we'll see how this goes. And this is where the scary stuff comes in. When I get a level up, it actually stalls my character, so I have to spam click this next spot. If I don't, it's going to get a hit on me. So this is level 2 magic, and we have to just spam... Oh, that was so lucky. He got the extra tile on me. Either way, that's 2 magic. We really need to get Water Strike to start hitting here. This is going to take a while. 
I decided to take a quick detour to the chest related chaos golems to train some magic real quick and unlock fire strike. Airstrike was just not doing it for us. Water strike unlocked, earth strike unlocked, and there is fire strike unlocked. Let's get back to barrows and not waste any more runes. We also hit 500 total level, that's awesome. Because I'm a low level, magic accuracy should actually help me out here. Normally for barrows, you only need to worry about magic strength, but in our circumstances, I think no matter how minuscule, the magic accuracy should help us out. Oh my god, we're actually hitting now. Look at this. This is a much better use of runes now. This is so scary. One mistake or one level up and we are screwed if we get hit. Is that it? Oh, and there we go. The first Barrows brother down. See, I told you we could do it. I think I'll take on all the melee brothers first as it's the same strategy for all of them. So let's go take on Guthan. Guthan's down. And there's a Wind Bolt unlocked. This is our first spell using Chaos Runes, so we have a use for them now. It only has a slightly higher max hit than Fire Strike, but it will be very useful when I start running low on Elemental Runes. We're out of run energy, so we've got to wait around every cast now. Let's hope he doesn't despawn, because all the brothers actually have a 10 minute despawn timer. This is an annoying thing with this strategy as well. Sometimes people or other brothers stack on my spawn, and if I click the wrong one, I'll more than likely get a hit. Torag's down. That's all the melee brothers down, meaning just Carol and Arim to go. The only way we can deal with Carol without protection prayers is to find a flinching spot. Ah crap, this won't work. Oh man, we used a lot of food there, I'm not sure if this is possible. Is that it? Yes. Oh, it is possible. I have never flinched Carol before, so I was genuinely not sure, but we have it in the safe spot. Now we have to rely on the adamant dagger pee we spoon from the Shades of Morton chest to actually hit. As mentioned earlier, all of the brothers have a 10 minute despawn timer, and flinching already causes us to deal less damage, so this poison will be very, very important. Yes, our first hit, let's hope it got poisoned. Now, if you're not sure what's going on here, flinching is a method of hitting NPCs without taking any damage in return. You have to hit the NPC, go back to the safe spot, and then wait for its health bar to disappear before hitting it again. It's a very useful strategy, but it's much, much slower than just fighting something. Oh, it's poisoned. Yes. I'm going to swap to the Adamant Scimitar now to hopefully deal more damage. This is going well. This is going really well, but the poison's down to hitting ones. I'm not sure if I should re-poison it or try brute forcing it with the Scimitar. Fuck, what? No. I can't believe it. Oh, I don't think the poison would have helped, but this is difficult. This is really, really difficult. We still needed to deal over 20 damage. Okay, round two. I remember that the maze random chest gave us some attack and strength potions, so I have hope. I will say the dagger is a lot more accurate with these pots. I've actually hit it like seven times. It's just not poisoned yet. Still not poisoned. I'm starting to think that if I don't get the poison in the first couple of minutes, maybe I should reset it. Oh my God, we got poison already. Okay, this is the run. We're almost five minutes into this kill and it's looking a bit better, but the poison's fell to two. This all relies on hitting this poison. This same guy's seen me like seven times killing this. That's how long I've been trying for. No, not again. I refuse to give up, but I think I do need to train my melee stats a little bit higher. I want to try out Wilderness Slayer to see if we can train efficiently and try to collect some Laren's keys, because the Laren's chest in Deep Wilderness is really, really freaking good for us. But to get a Slayer task from Crystillia, which is the only Slayer Master we can get the keys from, we need to make one exception of a single Slayer task from Toriel first. Okay, first Wilderness task. This has to be something really good for us with melee. If it's something we're going to have to save spot like Greater Demons, Fire Giants, we are screwed. So let's find out. Mammoths. Mammoths are far too much for us right now. God damn it. Oh, we're not going to be able to take on those at all just yet. So what we're going to have to do is find somewhere else to train. I really need some levels. So here we are at Crabs once again. Remember, we can kill these because they drop caskets. 50 strength, 40 defense just for the future if we hit any rune drops. Ooh, a clue scroll. Never lucky. And there's 50 attack. We also just got another clue that we can actually do as its first steps at Barbarian Village. So let's go take a detour. This game hates me, man. Round five. 
The poison literally carries this. The sim's not hit once. Oh, there we go. Just as we're saying it. The poison's gone back to three, so we're going to swap straight back to the dagger now, actually. Oh, we've re-poisoned straight away. This could be it. I think we have four to five minutes left. I'm camping the sim. Come on, we are so close. Come on. Yes. Oh, my God. God, Kirill down. That's five brothers. Now, I'm not sure what to do with our imp because normally you can say spot it in a similar way over here. But I've got it in the crypt, so I literally need to spawn it near a door and safe spot it without any other monsters. So I'm not sure that's going to work out. Now we're down the crypt, though, let's talk about reward potential. So as we know, whenever you kill a monster in the crypt, you get some reward potential. When you kill the brothers, you get some as well. And normally you want to end it around 88% to maximize the runes with no bolt racks and no loot half of keys, tooth half of keys or demeds. But because we're us, we want a level 60 defensive helm so we don't mind getting a demed. And going to 100% for the half keys is actually a decent plan. On top of that, we need to go above 88.1 for bolt racks. Because the Kirill's crossbow is a big part of raids for us, or at least the early plan until we unlock the gauntlet. But we can't do the normal Iron Man strategy of buying bolt racks at the Akainu guy in Port Phasmatis. We have to only get them from chests, and as you fire over a thousand an hour, even two thousand, we're gonna need to do a lot of barrows in the long run, and hopefully hit some bolt racks. So we are gonna be going to 100% potential every time. Decided I don't want to waste runes on kill count, so we are going to be flinching the skeletons as well. I think we can kill it before it despawns. Okay, we have no food left, so as soon as this bloodworm's dead, we need to loot and get out of here. We won't be killing Arim this chest, which means we are going to be one brother down, meaning a lower loot rate overall and one less loot roll on the Barrow's table. But it should still be a good chest. Okay, I'm going to open the chest and see if I can save spot Arim here. If not, I'll teleport out. We have a 10 minute timer. We do have one small problem as well. If this blood worm hits me, yep. Okay, we're just gonna loot. Bolt racks, yes, and 500 mind runes. Oh, that is amazing. That is actually amazing. We have to get out of here. I am so happy with that. Look at the mind rune stack. Oh my God. And we got some blood runes as well. I think that's the first blood runes on the account. The bolt racks are gonna be very, very, very important. As I said, ammo for the KCB, and we can't buy any, so we need to stack up as many of these as possible. I'm just getting some more food together, and we've just hit level 35, so we can now make pizza. These are really cheap and easy to make. They heal less per bite, but with two bites of pizza, they heal 14 per inventory slot, which outclasses our egg and tomato, which only heal eight. Ooh, Arim's in the crypt this time. This could be our six brother run. This would be huge, because a mini quest was recently introduced, where on a full Barrows run, and additional items dropped that when given to the strange old man on the surface, gives us 20,000 prayer experience. And because the item comes directly from the chest itself, this is totally valid experience for us. Come on, please. Yes, are in first try. Oh my God, that feels so good. Oh, and Carol's is here too. There's nothing stopping us getting six brothers now. Yes. Oh, we had to take some damage at the end because we literally had like 20 seconds left, but we got him okay this is it this is going to be the six brother chest i am so excited three brothers four and that is the fifth brother down oh oh my god please yes this is it this is gonna be the six brother chest i am so happy we're gonna get twenty thousand prayer xp we're gonna get an item i'm telling you we're gonna get an item and there we go all six brothers down with 24 magic and 16 prayer. This feels so good. Now let's just get that 100% potential. And here we go. Are we ready? Oh, no item, but we did get the strange icon and a combat achievement. 81 death runes to win. Look at the mind runes. This is so good. This is going to give us 20,000 prayer XP, and because it came from a chest, we can do it. Okay, so if we talk to the strange old man with the icon, we give it him, and then we get a lamp. Now, normally I said that I wouldn't be doing lamps from quests, but this is not a quest. This is something that I obtained with an item from a chest. And because it's unique to Barrows, what better fitting way to actually use it? So I do think this is completely valid. 
And there's 20,000 prayer experience. Getting us 35. That is so close to protect from magic. That is crazy. Unfortunately, we've still not got it yet. And we will need to do some prayer training soon. But for now, I'm happy. Okay, now I'm going to show a full Barrows run. Just so you can see how slow this is. I'll put a timer on screen as well. And here we are, 38 minutes later. 38 minutes is actually pretty quick because the Carol and Arim only took like 15 minutes, which is really good. We also got Varrock Teleport unlocked because we got 25 magic, so we've got an easy route out. Let's hope for an item. No item, but we did get an elite clue. There's no way we can do this, right? I mean... We can for now. Let's go try it. No way. No, we just hit the 150. One in 150 again for the tooth half. I think we got a loop half before. Is that it? Is that a full crystal key? We're going to have to look at that when we've tried doing this elite. Oh my god. Oh, this is a clue that I can't do because we can't do the Fremi quest line. And it is. It's a full crystal key. Oh my god. Wait. We can go and open the Tavoli chest. Let's do that. Let's just get this in the bank as a placeholder. Look at it. And here is the crystal chest. Now, this drops quite a lot of things. But the other things that we really want is an Addy Square Shield or Rune Legs or Rune Skirt, which is really rare to hit one of those. I will take the Iron Ore or Coal as well. So let's see what we get. And we got another half key. I mean, it's fine. We got a Dragonstone, just like every key gives. We got a bit of money. Better luck next time. Right, let's end the episode strong. We're either going to hit a Barrow's item or we're going to run out of runes. Let's see what happens first. This is the last of our potions, so I'm not sure how easy Kirill and Aram will be to kill after this, but only one way to find out. Oh my god. <laughs> well, that was close. Just hit 30 magic purely from Barrows. This is so fun. No, an Arim Crypt, meaning that we're probably only going to get five brothers this kill. And there's 31 magic and Lumbridge Teleport unlocked, which isn't that useful, but it is going to be useful for us. Our goal for the teleports really is going to be Fally and Camelot, because at the minute, we have to teleport to Soul Wars to actually get across to that side of the map for Camelot. And for Fally, it's a similar thing. We've got it. We've got it. Let's see if we can get a kill on Arim here. Our strength is really low, so we are going to have to use like all of this potion, unfortunately. But I wonder if it despawns down here after 10 minutes. I'm not sure. The minigame time is at 11.37, so I guess we'll find out. We actually did it. We did it pretty fast too, six minutes. We can do six brother chests, even if they spawn down here. I am so happy. Takes a little bit more effort though. No way, no way, no way, no way. We got an item. We got an item! Guthan's helm isn't even bad either. Tank helms are really good for this. Like, my best at the minute is a mining helmet. Man, we got a freaking Barrows item. I'm so happy. We've got to go for the back-to-back. -back. We've got to before we end this episode. We've just got enough food to do it, I think. So let's send it. We're bringing it along to be a good luck charm. The back-to-back. -back. Can we hit it? We cannot.